Guys, this is Gene Jensen nice with Bass Resource. This is Gene Jensen with BassResource.com. We got my two buddies on the boat. Uh, Evan Howard, is that right? <laughs> and uh, and Mike Buka. And uh, we're fishing with a floating fly today. We're going to talk about it. I'm going to teach you guys kind of how. To, um, actually, I'm going to have Mike teach you guys how to uh, how to catch bass on a floating fly. This one's going to take a little while. Evan just got hooked into a good one. Oh, big largemouth. And uh, it's going to be a little while, so let's sit back and watch this one. We're going to net this sucker. This is a big fish. He's fishing on, he's catching it on an ultralight, 10 foot ultralight rod, so it's going to take a little bit. Sushi. Look at what he cooked up. That's crazy. Water eel. Yep. About a week ago, I got in touch with got in touch with Mike Buca, and he was uh, talking about on Facebook. He was talking about catching spotted bass on a floating fly. So I was like, man, I really wanted. We've been talking about it for about two years. I really wanted him to teach me how to do a floating fly. So I came up here during Christmas break. Um, out here on the lake, um, uh, it just so happens my mother-in-law and father-in-law live close to here, and uh, and we're out here on Carter's Lake in North Georgia, and he's going to show me and and uh, he's been showing Evan for the last couple of weeks how to how to fish this floating fly. We're going to go over the um, the rods, the lures, what else? You name it. Locations. Locations. Uh, lures, line, rods, reels. Um, you know the bobbers are a very key part. Yep, yep. So, we're, so we'll, we'll be covering everything. We're going to go into go into pretty good depth. Um, we've uh, already done most of the the fishing. I'm going to do some cut-ins during this video. We caught some pretty decent fish doing this. It's been an absolute blast. So uh, hang tight. We'll sit, get set up for uh, for the rest of the video, and uh, and and we'll just just roll from there. Hey y'all, uh, welcome to Carter's Lake. Uh, we're going to give you a little bit of a tutorial on a uh, floating fly technique. Uh, some advanced stuff and also some beginner stuff for those of you that are not familiar with the technique. Uh, we'll go over a little bit of the equipment and, uh, and go into detail on that and tell you what you need and why I use what I use. Um, there are many different ways of doing the fly and uh, they all work. Some may be easier than others. So I'm going to just go over what I used and what I've found out over the years. Um, what I use real rise and rod wise, uh, I use a uh, Pinnacle Vertex 10-foot uh, spinning rod. Um, I believe they use these for steelhead fishing uh, up in the northeast, but it's a very whippy rod, um, and it's used for helping to cast these long 10-foot leaders or even 12, 13, 14-foot leaders or even shorter. Um, it also aids in being able to control the fish and being able to use the light line in this super ultra clear water. Um, reels not as important as a rod. Uh, any kind of 2000 series, 2500 series reel would work. Um, you know, just as long as it has a good smooth drag and it holds up, that's really all you're looking for. So any of your basic bass tackle um, reel will work for, for the floating fly. Um, line, as far as I'm concerned, I use braid as the uh, as my main line. Actually what I do as a cheap person, uh, I usually fill half of my reel or maybe three quarters of my reel with mono and then I put braid over that because braid handles very well on the spinning rod. Uh, it doesn't tangle, it doesn't seem to twist as much as fluorocarbon or monofilament. Uh, so I use about eight pound braid. I like to use colored braid for many reasons. Um, I, since your braid is above the water, your braid is not below the water, it helps you see the braid. It also helps you see your line so that when you uh, when you cast out, you have, you're dealing with these 10 foot rods, you get a lot of slack in your line. So you need to know when you get a bite, how much you need to reel up 
to set the hook because you do have a lot of slack in your line, especially with the windy days. Um, so that helps you see your line is a big is a big thing. I just like to use the Power Pro. I use uh, Fireline White in eight to ten pound test. Pick one. It doesn't matter as far as color is concerned. Uh, I like a stiff braid versus a limp braid. It just seems to uh, not tangle as much. Um, but anyway, over my braid, I use a 10 foot four carbon leader. Usually I use around eight pound test. Sometimes they get fickle. I use six pound test. Uh, I've gone as low as four or two pound test, but I'd really like to try to stay in the six to eight pound range because you really retire quite a bit um, when you use your four carbon leaders. Son of a freaking gun. Oh, Mike's got one too. <laughs> Double. This is a good one. Shut up. Good. <laughs> we got the camera going. Yeah, we're good. Oh, oh, put it down, put it down. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a good one. You got a good one, Gene. Get us out of this tree, Mike. <laughs> Mike, Mike, get us out of the tree. Golly. Oh, we got a tail walking spot. Hold on, he's on my lawn. I'll be dragging over to you. That's a good one, bud. That's a good one, brother. Yes, sir. <laughs> I could have let you guys have all the fun. Oh, that's awesome. Finally. Uh, I called him. Yeah. Finally. They're in the trees. That is awesome. Oh. Wow, that was cool. I hope you got something on camera. All of it. That's what I'm talking about. A triple on the float and fly. <laughs> it ain't big, but, but it is fun. <laughs> Uh, something that I do a little different um, than most, uh, I use a, uh, there's different cork methods there, and, and you can, you, oh, they all work. I started using, tinkering around, and I came up with a uh, stick cork. Um, this is basically a weighted cork, and I took the weight, and I put it in the center of the, uh, the styrofoam. Just cut it with a bandsaw, take the wire out, countersink the weight into the bottom half, and glue it back together. Um, so that's basically what I did with this. And what this does, and the importance of that, is when your cork hits the water, it sits horizontally. As your fly goes down the water column and gets to the end of the leader lane, it tips over. So, all right, why is that important? Well, when you were kids, you saw your cork go down, you set the hook, all is good. But you're dealing with 10 foot leaders here. The fish, a lot of times, were very lethargic. They don't move a lot. They don't sink the cork. They don't tank it like the brim do. A lot of your bites are just very, very subtle, down. A lot of times what happens is, is they'll hit the fly and they'll come up. So what happens to your cork is that you counterbalanced it. When they come up, your cork turns to the side. And that indicates that you have a, what we call a lift bite. Um, a lot of people, well, that's not really, you know, it's, not, it's the fine details of things, but 20% of your hits are probably lift bites. Um, I know uh, Evan here caught one with a nice large mouth on a lift bite this morning. Six pounds. Hey, it's worth it to put that little extra effort in being able to detect those lift bites by playing with your cork and messing with it and, and making sure that it's, it's counterbalanced right. A lot of advantages of this. All you do is you attach it to the braid. You make your leader about nine foot, ten foot long. You attach your cork to the braid and not the not, not the fluorocarbon. That way, you're not crimping your braid. Your your cork is not sliding up and down the braid. I mean, or down the um, fluorocarbon. It's all it's all taking the 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 the, uh, the braid is taking the brunt of the punishment from your cork. All right, so that makes that's one of the reasons why I use this. You could take it off if you get hung, reel it down, put it in your pocket, reel down to your fly, dislodge your fly, no problem. Um, another advantage is it's heavier than your three-way bobber system. It's easier to see because it's bigger. You're bobbing in the waves. Which one is easier to see? Um, 
it's a little heavier, it's easier to see, it sticks up. It's just a lot of advantages that I, I go through the, uh, the trouble of, of making my own uh, versus the uh, conventional methods. Something that you need to try and play with, they all work. You just need to pick a system that works for you and what makes the most sense for your, your type of fishing. Um, as far as monofilament to braid, I use a uni to uni knot. Pick one that works for you. As long as it doesn't break, you're good. Uh, as far as my knots to my fly, I like to use a braid knot. Very simple. If you Google braid knot, you'll come up with a, my version of what I, what I tie. It's a very simple knot. If you have a knot, a polymer knot works wonderful. Uh, just pick a braid knot, a knot that, you, that you're comfortable with. Uh, flies. Uh, I've been working with Christy and David Lester over at Nature's Tackle Box for a couple of years and they've been tying their own flies and I really, really like their flies. One of the things that I like, and you know, if I'm in the swim bait business, I built my swim baits around the eyes. I like 3D eyes, I like the eyes to pop because I feel like it gives the bait realism. I like to be able to see the eyes from the side of the bait, not countersink them. And that's what a lot of these flies are. They have a 3D eye on them. They're, as far as I know, they're the only uh, fly that's made that has 3D eyes on it. It uh, comes with a uh, barbarian hook, super sharp hook, super strong. Never had any problems with them bending or breaking. Uh, come in a bunch of different colors. They are hand tied in Hiram, Georgia by David Lester. Uh, he got a plethora of colors. Uh, this just happened to be the spot on color. Um, my favorite colors I like to use is the spot sushi, I like the spot candy, I like the habanero, I like the Etowah daughter. Um, those are some of my favorite color flies that I like to use um, that I tie with. Um, that pretty much sums it up for equipment. Um, what I'm probably going to go in next is probably the casting and go in uh, how do you go about casting this and how do you set up and, and what's the proper technique for casting i got a, i got a question um what what time of year is best for this good question um mostly winter yeah. uh it's primarily a winter tap uh, tactic it uh it, it caters around the water temperature when your water temperature gets ideally 55 i've caught them as hot as 60. Um, but they do really really well in the winter time what happens is is the, is the cold water if you get a cold front they tend to suspend and that's where the, the fly is really uh, is really uh, advantageous and where it works. The thing that, uh, my theory on suspended fish is if you fish for suspended fish 100% of the time, you will catch bigger spotted bass because I feel like the bigger spots that like to suspend, usually when you have a brush pile, you usually catch fish in the brush are usually suspended above the brush. You catch the little ones in the brush pile, but the big ones are usually on top. And that's what I like to do. And that's what the fly caters in on. There's not very many lures, conventionals, that you can fish slowly and keep the bait in one position at, you know, to be able to cater to those suspended fish, especially when they're inactive. All right. Um, what kind of, you were talking about weather, and the last couple of days we've been looking for a certain type of weather. Um, what exactly are you looking for with any those type of conditions? Okay. Um, ideally, what you want is you want prefrontal. When the front's going through, when it's nasty and miserable, that's when you need to be on the water. Uh, if it's a nice day, it's usually not as good. Ideally, you want clouds, you want wind, you want clear water, preferably five, six feet or, gray, or clear. Um, and you want pro funnel. You want that. You want that barometric pressure moving, uh, and that's what usually turns them on. And usually, gives it, it's it's measurable. I mean, you see, I'm dressed up here, and I'm actually shedding clothes. But ideally, you want to be out there when it's raining and snowing and sleeting and yep. winds blowing and that kind of stuff. You know, you don't put yourself in danger. In danger, but you know, that's the kind of things that that the fish like as far as the fly bite. Yeah, the last couple of days I've noticed that well, we, we've been fishing nothing but steep ledges and bluff walls and Correct. and, and yeah. stuff like that. But. Yeah, I key, I key in on a lot of the bluffs. Uh, one thing we didn't fish is we uh, we didn't fish a lot of humps and stuff. The shallow humps, that usually work. But I usually, my, my ideal situation for a bluff is if you're 10 feet from the shore and it's 10 feet deep, that is perfect. Because when you cast, that fly hits the bank you want it to pendle them down without hitting the bank, or maybe brush it and, and, and countersink right under that uh, under that, uh, that 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 cork. Uh, that's ideally what you want. Um, I also, like you do in the summertime, usually you, uh, when you're fishing bluff walls, you usually chase the shade. As the sun gets higher, you try to 
fish those areas that are that are shaded by the bluffs. So what I do strategy wise is I fish a lot of the bluff walls that are going to get to hit the sun first because you can always fish the shaded side of the, of the bluff walls, but the ones that they hit first, the sun hits first. You know, you, you just you just plan your milk run based on how the sun comes up and what bluff gets hit first. If it's a good bluff and it gets the sun first, you fish that first because you won't be able to fish it later today. It won't be as productive because the sun's not on it. Oh. Guys, there's nothing more fun than laying into a hard fighting spotted bass with a little bitty fly, a little light, light line. And a 10, 10 foot ultralight rod. That's a floating fly. Not bad, look at that. Beautiful fish. Nice big spotted bass. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, about the casting technique for the fly. If you're a fly fisherman, you'll get you'll you'll be uh, you'll be able to master this fairly quickly. Um, it's very important that when you fish. The bluff walls, this is not, not a perfect location, but it's secluded from the wind for us so we can do the video. Um, you really want to get your fly as close to the bluff wall as you possibly can without getting hung. Uh, easier said than done. You're casting, you know, we have a 10 foot leaner in your cork, um, so it takes a 10 foot rod to be able to cast it. So what I'm going to do is go over the technique of how to cast this thing. Um, Basically what I like to do is have the cork about a foot and a half, two foot below the tip of the rod. And what I'll do, depending on where you are in the boat, if you're a passenger in the boat, you might want to go front arm and over the motor. If I'm sitting here in the back, up here in the front of the boat, what I'll do is I'll do a backhand cast. The technique is the same, just depending on which side of, the, of your body that you throw the, uh, the fly with. But wait, basically the mechanics is, is when you want to take it over, you want the fly to land out here and you want it to lay out. And the reason you want it to lay out is because when you come forward, the rod tip is going to load up. And when that rod tip loads up, it gives you inertia so that you can propel the lure of the fly towards it because you're, you're not dealing with the very heavy bait. I mean, you're looking at less than, less than a quarter ounce maybe. The fly is a sixteenth ounce and the cork probably doesn't weigh much more than that. So you're, lo you're using the water to load up your rod to be able to propel the bait. So what you do, you bring it over, all in one motion, bring it over and then go forward. Don't stop. You want to completely do this in one full motion. I'm going to give you an example right now. Two feet. So I'm going to go like this, load the rod tip up. And if you did it right, your fly will land in front of your cork. So basically the cork is going to land 10 feet from the bluff wall and your fly is going to be 10 feet is going to hit the bluff wall or very close to it. Ideally that is basically what you're trying to do. So one technique that I like to do for beginners a lot is obviously make sure you have your reel full of line. I like to feel it very, very heavy because when you're dealing with wind or you're trying to get a get distance uh, for every cast, you need to make sure your spool is full. So what I try to do with beginners is I tell them to overthrow it. And what that does is when you overthrow it, you stop it and basically it stops your cork and your fly will pass your cork up and straighten out. And so basically what now is your cork, is your fly, is coming down, coming down, it tips your cork straight up. And that ideally is I got a fish, hold on. <laughs> Sorry about this, folks. And it works like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a left bite. Yeah, I think I might have got the cork on the video, so. And it really works. Another thing you to remember is, is don't be in a hurry to get these fish in, even if they're small fish. You're, Ideally, I'm just, you're using light stuff. I, I, if you fish by yourself, I re highly recommend one of these long nets. That way you can reach out and touch one. You just get them in there and get them in here like this. So, yep. It doesn't get a better example than catching a fish on your example, guys. <laughs> 
There you go. Nice little spot of bass. Good deal. Now, yeah, like I was saying, there's 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 one thing I notice is is when you're fighting your fish, it's going to take you a while. Don't be in a hurry to get your fish in the in the boat, especially those big ones. You're fighting them on light line with an ultra light rod. It's going to be it's going to take a while. I mean, Evan's six pounder took five minutes this morning. Um, a nice big spot. I mean, if you get a big spot of bass, it's going to fight and never give up. It could be you know six, seven, eight minutes before you even get a three pounder in the boat. Just take your time, wear them out, get your net down in there, and and scoop them up. It's 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 a blast. It's an absolute blast. We've had a ball the last couple of days, but uh, anyway, I'm gonna turn the time back over to Mike. I'll shut up. <laughs> That's it. I uh, appreciate everybody. Uh, if you have any questions about the float and fly, we have a uh, forum, uh, float and fly bass fishing. Just go, uh, put it up there in the search engine. And you can shoot me an email or you can uh, go to Christy in Hiram, Georgia, Nature Stocker Box, and go to their shop. She'll be happy to help you with anything that you need to know concerning the flies and the float and fly technique. All right, well, that's about as good as a video. That's about as good as video you can get. This is, uh, like I said, this is Gene Jensen with Bass Resource. Um, like I always say, visit BassResource.com for the answer to all your questions about bass fishing. Check out Evan's blog and his website that he's working on, uh, Mike. Uh, makes the, the, the famous bull shad swim bait. About to come out with another one that I'm really excited about, the, uh, the herring swim bait. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more excited than anybody because that's my lake is, is a herring lake. Um, and uh, and we've got some exciting things going on this year. And, uh, and have fun fishing. Enjoy this, this new technique. It's new for me. I'm going to try it on large mouth. I'm going to try it all around everywhere I fish and, uh, and, and see whether it works on, on other places. Um, but have a great day fishing and take care.